Hello and welcome back to the Stronger Than Steel podcast. My name is John Kieran. With me as always is my co-host Austin Davidson. Hey yo. Uh, today we will be previewing the Steelers week 10. Is week 10 or week 11? This is week 11. Week 11 matchup against the Cleveland Browns. The Steelers are moving on from their 35-30 to loss to the Dallas Cowboys. A heartbreaking game to say the least. But uh, the, this might have been just what the doctor ordered if, as far as what the Steelers are looking for. They travel to Cleveland to face an 0-10 Cleveland Browns. The Steelers will be looking to snap a four-game losing streak. Uh, historically, the Steelers have dominated the new Cleveland Browns, especially over the past 15 years. No stat is more telling of this than Ben Roethlisberger's 19-2 all-time record against the Browns. With 5,000 passing yards and 35 touchdowns to only 17 picks, his 905 winning percentage is the best of any quarterback against a single opponent that's been that has faced an opponent uh, 15 times since the 1970 NFL merger. And that actually doesn't even include his 379 yard 3 TD performance last year when he came off the bench in relief of Landry Jones, setting an NFL record for passing yards by a player who didn't start the game. So a brief look in uh, to each team. Obviously, the Pittsburgh Steelers, we know we've lost four straight games. Uh, last week, being in heartbreaking fashion, giving up in what essentially was a walk-off touchdown to Ezekiel Elliott and the Cowboys. The Steelers come into this game with the 11th-ranked offense in the league, averaging just over 370 yards a game. The bulk of that has come from their passing yards, averaging about 280 yards while they've been struggling in the run department 25th in the league at 90.7 yards uh defensively uh the Steelers have obviously been struggling against the pass giving up over 278 yards that's good for 28th in the league and against the run they're 16th at 102.7 um Cleveland being 0-10 does not boast a good offense or defense at all. Uh, 28th offensively and 31st defensively. Uh, You want to touch on the injury report, Austin? Yes, sir. So, Sammy Coates is expected to play. He was a full participant in both Wednesday and Thursday. Jordan Dangerfield is questionable after being limited Tuesday, Wednesday, and then full on Thursday. Uh, Xavier Grimble was limited on Tuesday, full participant on Wednesday, then back to limited on Thursday. He is questionable. Cameron Hayward has been ruled out for the season. He's out. Hayward Bay has been ruled out. He didn't participate in one practice this week. Uh, Marcus Pouncey did not participate on Tuesday, but he's a full participant on Wednesday and Thursday, so he's expected to play. Shamarco Thomas didn't practice all week. He's out. Marcus Whedon did not practice all week. He is out. And D'Angelo Williams is still recovering from surgery and didn't practice all week. He is out. Also, looking at the Browns, Shamon Williams, who did not practice on Thursday, is listed as questionable for the Browns. Um, of all those guys uh, who have a chance of playing, guys like Grimble, Green, Dangerfield, Coates, and Pouncey. Which one of them, obviously besides Pouncey, do you think would have the biggest impact uh, should they play? I think the biggest impact is going to be with uh, Xavier Grimble and Ladarius Green. I I really uh, enjoy the tight ends. I mean, I I rip on them, but having a good tight end to check down to, we've been rotating. I like the rotation, so I think it would mess it up if one of the two tight ends is out. Yeah, they... uh, Obviously, we've only seen a little bit from Green, considering he only played, I think, 12 snaps in his first game with the Steelers last week. But looking back at uh, all the other tight ends who have played this year, it's nice to see that they can all do a little bit, even if they can't do a lot of things well, they can still do some things. Um, I think we can expect to see Sammy Coates playing only special teams again. A report came out uh, this past week that he has two broken fingers now. I think they're broken, or at least he has two finger injuries so it's pretty hard to catch a ball when you have uh, both your fingers taped up. So uh, expect him to be a non-factor in the offense and just a uh, special teams play this week. Um, Bud Dupree has come off the IR, and it's we're not sure yet if he's going to play, but it's looking like there's a chance he will. How how important is his return to this defense, Austin? This defense needs something, some sort of pass rush, some sort of anything. Dupree might be that guy to bring it back. He's fast. He provides that speed off the edge. He might be the man who brings this pass rush to something because it's 
not shown anything. We lost Cameron Hayward, our run stuffer, the only possible person that, that could provide pass rush. So we need Bud Dupree to step up. Hopefully he can. He, provi- he can provide that. He has the speed, and he's also pretty good in coverage because of the speed. He can keep up with some pretty fast receivers or, and tight ends. So I hope to see from him when he gets back. Honestly, even him and his – I'm sorry. What were you saying? Oh, no, I was, I was done. You oh. go ahead. Honestly, even Dupree at his worst right now is, prob- is probably still the best pass rushing outside linebacker, maybe outside of James Harrison. If you look at this defense without Dupree and its main pass rushers, even going back to last year, you have to look at Cameron Hayward as probably being the best, followed by James Harrison and Stephon Tuitt, which – uh, to it is more of a run stopper who can rush the passer when he's asked to and Harrison who actually is now uh, the listed starter at right outside linebacker is mostly a pass rushing specialist at this point I think that his becoming the starter was honestly more of a formality I, I am a little disappointed with how little he's played given how we already knew what we were getting from Jarvis Jones and it just it hasn't been impressive do you think we're going to see a little more of James Harrison now on the field now with Shazier and uh, Jarvis Jones comes on with Moat since we did the rotation and uh, we see Shazier a lot so I think we're going to see James Harrison a lot I think it's going to make a difference I'm just with excluding Bud Dupree have, are any of these guys any like do you could you see any of these guys starting for any other team besides the Steelers because honestly I can't. Most of these guys, I honestly think, wouldn't even have roster spots, uh, maybe excluding Chicolo. I think Chicolo has a nice upside as a nice, uh, what is it, rotation linebacker. I think he has a high potential for that. Uh, everyone else, I think, is not honestly not very good. James Harrison might be the only other person I could see who could actually play on other teams because of his role as a pass rusher. I just I don't think Jarvis Jones would be able to be on another team I really don't know what's happened to Arthur Motes. He's it feels like he's completely disappeared. So anything from Bud Dupree would be helpful this week, don't you think? Yeah, I think possibly though in a three four, I think someone would want Chazier for his speed. I think I think someone would want Chazier to start at middle linebacker. I um I was referring to only the outside linebackers. I'm sorry. I uh, okay. I, I wasn't even That's thinking about that. <laughs> Um, someone else who I do want to see, now that you mentioned the inside linebackers, is a little more Vince Williams. Uh, Lawrence Timmons, it's clear he's he's on his way out as he hasn't been playing as well for the past couple years now. The way NFL offenses are shifting, you don't really need uh, big, slow linebackers anymore. So I'm surprised we haven't seen as much Vince Williams, who is basically a faster, uh, less experienced version of Timmons. Wouldn't you say so? Oh, yeah. Uh, we saw him come in when... For uh, Shazier's injury in the beginning of the year, and he was doing pretty decently. So it's kind of surprising that we haven't seen him as much. I'm thinking if uh, if the Steelers keep getting burned, they might end up going to a more should they play more dime. But uh, we'll see uh, where that takes us because it's uh, unlikely the Browns are going to be setting the world on fire with their passing offense or anything from their offense. But then again, they're playing the Steelers' defense, so we're going to have to see uh, what that entails. So. Uh, looking back at uh, the Browns game now, what is it going to take for the Steelers to finally get a quality performance on the road, do you think? They had a win in week one against the Redskins on the road, but I think that's more of an aberration simply because it's the first game of the year. You've been waiting all year. You know who you're going to play then, and you're preparing for that game all off season. So that might have been a little different, especially shaking off the rust. So what is it going to take for the Steelers to get a quality performance on both sides of the ball on the road? Because they haven't put one together yet. This game might just be what we need. And what I mean by that is taking on the Browns. It's a huge confidence boost going against a winless team and destroying them. That's only if we destroy them. If we don't, it's going to be really, really sad. But to get us going, the coaches just need to let Roethlisberger do what he does best and not overcomplicate things. We've seen... What happens in the beginning, we just stick to the same plan and it just ruins us. And then uh, we're in the fourth quarter, or when it's too late, we're like, oh, now it's time to turn it on. And we start heating up when we let Roethlisberger do his thing. So we need to just let that happen from the beginning. We need to let Roethlisberger do his thing, not overcomplicate the offense, and that will get us going. 
uh, the Steelers just need to get going early. That that will be easy. Once you set the tone, it really, really helps. Absolutely. And how about you? What do you think? Uh, just quickly commenting on what uh, you were saying, thinking back to the losses against Philadelphia and Miami, both were poorly played games on the road. I just remember how the offense played early on in that game, especially Philadelphia, Marcus Wheaton dropping a pass in the end zone, uh, and then the next play leading to a blocked field goal. That really set the tempo for that game, which the Steelers were never able to recover from. Playing on the road and being able to take the crowd out of the game is definitely a huge factor. You want to see the Steelers do that. And I think it's really important for the offense, well, I guess all the coaches in general, to make sure that they make adjustments over the course of this game. It feels like too many times in games like Miami, in games like Philadelphia and Baltimore, the Steelers didn't make adjustments, particularly on offense, until the game was already out of hand. Take a, uh, take the Baltimore game. The Steelers were down, what was it, 21 to twenty one to nothing? 21 to, oh, it was uh, 21 to 7, I think, wasn't it? It was, it was 21 to zero. It was 21 to zero. Yes, the Steelers weren't getting anything done offensively until they finally turned it loose when they had nothing to lose, and they were finally able to start putting some points together. So I think it's important that the Steelers realize that if something is not working, they need to change it rather than just keep banging their heads against the wall, which is what they feel like they've been doing. So you had a you had a question about the uh, two point conversions uh, from last week, didn't you? Uh, yes. Uh, in the last game, there were six missed two point conversions, if I'm remembering correctly. You Four are. coming from the Steelers. Uh, what did what was that? I was saying you were correct. Oh, okay. Uh, how do you feel about the aggressiveness of going for two? Should the Steelers keep going for two, or should they just settle for the point after attempt? This has been something that's been discussed by uh, analytics gurus a lot over the past few years, especially last year with the whole change in uh, PATs going from the twenty uh, from a twenty yard field goal to now I believe it's a thirty three yard field goal. Uh, s- statistically, the Steelers usually make about two thirds of two point conversions, which would make it worth it uh, to go for two every time. I don't know if I agree with this necessarily. I feel like usually you don't have much to lose by just taking the PAT, but I do understand why they go for two when they score first. I like that, but looking back at the game, I think the Steelers uh, made a good call going for two the first time. I like the aggressiveness. The second time, I felt like it was really unnecessary that they were chasing points. And obviously the third and fourth time they went for two, it was completely necessary given the nature of the situation. Uh, But overall, I think uh, going for two is is a good idea when you score first, but it's not something you should get in the habit of. What do you think? Uh, What I think, I like going for two, and I still stick with this decision of going for it, even in the last week when we lost, because it just, I like the aggressiveness. I like the fear that it in, installs in, uh, the other team that they have to go for two probably if the Steelers get it. I really do like it. I, I trust in it because I think the Steelers realize that the offense is their strong point. Their defense isn't going to help them. So the best they could do on offense is probably the best to go with because the defense will probably give up a touchdown. It's just how it is. The defense isn't as good as our offense. It's not as high-powered, so I really like going for two. All right. Um, Obviously, this year, the Steelers' uh, defensive ranks are not very good. It's been a much maligned unit. Every positional group has gotten its heat, particularly the defensive line and linebackers for struggling in the running game a lot this year. Uh, One position group that I don't think is getting enough attention is the safety group. Uh, the pairing of Robert Golden and Mike Mitchell have been really disappointing, particularly the last three weeks. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion on them quickly and why they might be playing so badly, and if there is there a solution to their play and making them better? All right. So Mike Mitchell has always just been decent. He was never great. He was never totally bad. He was just decent. But he's getting paid to be great. One more time. But he's getting paid to be great, isn't he? He is being paid to be great. I think he's on a five-year, $5 million deal. So he's, he's not performing as his deal shows. But 
A lot of the reason people consider him good is his physicality. He lays big hits and causes a few fumbles and drops in his time, but with, with this physicality, he misses tackles. And this is important. He goes for the big hit rather than wrapping the person up. Just look at what happened on the two big plays given up in Baltimore game and the Ravens game. They were both his fault. He, he missed tackles on, on Mike Wallace and on uh, Ezekiel Elliott. He took bad angles and made a bad t- tackle. However, on the other side, Robert Golden has been injured, and honestly, going into the season, I didn't expect much from him. I mean, he's been disappointing just, as, just that he's not doing good, but I didn't really expect him to be good. I just expected him to fill the role of starting safety. Absolutely. Uh, um, he did give up the 50-yard touchdown. It was on his side. It, it, I wouldn't say he gave it up. He had to choose whether to leave Artie Burns alone or cover the middle of the field, and he chose the middle of the field, and it just happened that Artie Burns got burnt. So I, I don't really blame that on him because he, he had to make a choice, and he, he chose the wrong one, but it really could have gone either way. The guy that in the middle of the field looked open, I forget who it was, but uh, now is there a solution? I don't really think so. I'm about to ready to see Mike Mitchell walk, but his contract isn't up until 2019, so it's highly unlikely that the Steelers will cut him. And in the past, Steelers don't tend to trade often. I don't remember the last trade. Oh, of course I do. It's, it's uh, Gilbert, the cornerback. But I don't really remember the Steelers trading away someone. Um, and hopefully in this time period that Mike Mitchell is here, rookie Sean Davis can develop and possibly take over. That's my only hope. <laughs> I don't really see much else happening. It's We're in a really bad position with how long we have Mike Mitchell signed for. I'm hoping it's something that we uh, can address in the draft this year, but you actually just mentioned Justin Gilbert. This is an interesting situation. It's kind of like the Brandon Boykin situation all over again, it feels like. Uh, against the Browns, his former team, do you think this is the game we actually see him play a lot? Because he hasn't really played much defense this year, but this is the team he supposedly knows, don't you think? I don't going to see playing time. I don't understand why he hasn't seen playing time. I thought we traded for him to have someone start for us at, like, the nickel or whatever. But, uh, he's just, he hasn't seen playing time, and the coaches really haven't touched on it much. It it is another Boykin situation. I I think he's just going to remain on the bench again. I don't know. I, I'm hoping we do see him because if we don't see him now, I mean, when are we ever going to? And then what was the point of picking him up? I just, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Going back to the safeties, I agree with you on your uh, thoughts on both of them, honestly, Um, particularly Golden. I like him as a player. He's been around for a while. He's a great special teams player. I never really thought of him much as a starting safety. I'm glad he's getting the opportunity, but he's honestly just a pretty good run defender and not much else. Uh, So I do fault him for not being able to make plays that he needs to be able to make, but at the same time, you have to realize that he does have limitations. Mike Mitchell, on the other hand, I I had high hopes for him when he was signed in the 2014 season. He struggled that year. True, he had a torn groin, but after last year, I was hoping we had seen him turn the corner to a decent safety, someone who could be a serviceable starter. But this year, I I just haven't been impressed with him very much. Yes, he has that physical element to his game, but it just feels like that playmaking ability is gone for whatever reason. Maybe it's part of the rest of the defense not performing, but I I really want to see him uh, forcing more turnovers because it really just doesn't feel like he's doing a good job, and we already touched on the missed tackling he's been having this year. So I don't know what it's going to take, but I really I'm, – I'm disappointed in the way both of them has played, and I feel like it's time that the light has been shined on both of them. So uh, moving on, the Steelers' offense, at least the passing game, has been predicated on the deep ball. Do you like how often the Steelers have been taking uh, deep shots this year? I like the deep shots when Coates wasn't injured. That's that's how I feel about it. Right now, I'm not really liking the deep shots anymore because we don't have that person to catch the deep shots. And two people that are really prepared for it, and three if you count suspensions, but is Coates and uh, Hayward Bay. Also, the suspensions is Mark Davis Bryant. But right now, with Coates' finger injuries, he's become almost useless on this offense, and the deep ball just hasn't worked with anyone else. Like I said, the only other two people is Darius Hayward Bay and Mark Davis Bryant, who are that type of receiver that just burns someone and catches deep down the field. 
uh, with uh, these both being injured, uh, I think the intermediate routes are the best route. Like the route that Eli Rogers tends to run and make catches on it. What are your thoughts on it? What do you think? I agree with you completely. Uh, the main guys who can run deep routes, the guys who are known for it, are guys like Coates, Hayward Bay, and Bryant. Obviously, with Bryant and Hayward Bay being out, uh, Coates was supposed to be that guy, and he was for a while, but obviously his injury, it's pretty hard to catch a football with two injured fingers. Um, <clears throat> we can see Antonio Brown run the deep ball, uh, the deep route, but that's not usually his thing. His thing is usually those intermediate routes like you touched on. Um, we did see a couple deep balls to Kobe Hamilton. I'm not sure he has that blazing speed that uh, the other guys have, so I think he might be more of a red zone option. Um as far as the deep ball, I think you can still throw it, but it's something that without that deep guy in the lineup, I think it's something that you can't turn to six times a game. It might be something you, something you can only throw a couple times a game or maybe a little more if you get a uh, drawn offsides like the Steelers did a few times last week. Uh, I feel like Antonio Brown and Ben Roethlisberger just has, have not been on the same page at all this year. And it's weird because you look at their numbers, particularly Brown, it doesn't scream anything bad. It's just the unearthly performance we've seen from him from the last two or three years. His numbers are a little down from that, and it just feels like he hasn't gotten those intermediate catches that he's turned into big gains yet. It seems like he's been, particularly last week, minus his last few catches, it was all short passes that were being turned into five to ten yard gains. I want to see a little more of Eli Rogers, and obviously the injury to Marcus Wheaton is hurting the passing game in the middle of the field. But I think guys like Ladarius Green returning to the lineup are going to help the passing game in the middle, and I'm hoping that will let uh, Brown roam free for more intermediate routes. Um, look, shifting. Feel, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I feel like that's what we've been asking for for the past like three weeks since we started this podcast. We just want to see more out of Eli Rogers. He's such an exciting guy, and we think he could be so good. And it just hasn't like happened. He had that 110 yard game or 106, I believe it was, and it, it was towards the end of the game, but. We want to see that more in the beginning. We've just been asking for it. It really hasn't happened, and it's really sad. I think he's just, he's still finding his way in the NFL. That's why I think the loss of Marcus Whedon or the ineffectiveness of his play has really been maybe, I don't want to say a forgotten part of this offense, but I think it's something that was crucial in the Steelers' performance in the second half of last season, pretty much from the Seattle game on, where he was playing really well. And the offense just kicked into a higher gear, and it just feels like the Steelers have never hit that gear, and I feel like that's part of the reason. Yeah, I get that. So, we're going to go talk about the Browns' offense now. Is there anyone we need to look out for on that offense? Well, this is not an offense that's going to make anybody's eyes pop out based on their uh, statistics, but there's always a couple... Uh, players on any NFL team that are gonna that you're gonna game plan for, and I think the biggest weapon that the Browns have is Terrell Pryor, the former Ohio State quarterback turned wide receiver is probably one of the best athletes in the NFL today. Uh, Steelers fans, in case you need to be reminded, he has the longest touchdown run by a quarterback in NFL history, and it came against the Pittsburgh Steelers when he was playing for the Raiders a few years ago. So we know he's fast. His ability to catch the ball over the past couple of years has led him to becoming the number one receiver in Cleveland. He doesn't have a ton of catches, and he has only found the end zone five times combined on the ground and through the air. But for someone who is so athletic and someone who is the only true option in the passing game on the outside, it's important that the Steelers make sure that he's double covered and he needs to be, and the Steelers need to make sure that they watch out for the trick plays utilizing him, whether it's him throwing a pass or end arounds to him or reverses with him. He is definitely the biggest weapon on their team, in my opinion. But I know there are a couple other players on that offense that can make plays. Uh, who do you think is uh, someone the Steelers need to watch on defense? Well, the Browns haven't been the best rushing team. I, uh, you said they were the 22nd overall. I believe we need to watch out for Isaiah Crow. 
the Steelers defense has shown that they struggle against running backs. The Ezekiel Elliott last week. It, it's important to make the Browns one-dimensional and force whoever is starting at quarterback, which is named McCown, but that could easily change to Kessler, to throw and make mistakes. So that's always been a Browns thing to do. To, the quarterback is always the problem with the Browns, and we need to force them to throw. So, also an honorable mention is Joe Thomas, who is, is also going to cause a problem for our almost now non-existent pass rush without Cameron Hayward. You know, I saw a statistic sometime this week saying that James Harrison had never beaten Joe Thomas for a full sack, or at least not in the past wow. four years. That's, yeah. See, Joe Thomas is going to be a really big problem. He's he's so good. I mean, it's it's kind of a shame that he's playing on this team, but he's he's been such a good player for so long. Uh, going back to Isaiah Crowell, he uh, he hasn't gotten a ton of attention given the fact that he's on the Browns. But I remember a few years ago, he just he has a knack for finding open space, and he's he's someone that can do uh, a little bit of everything. And I'm I'm particularly worried about the screen game because the Steelers just aren't good at defending it. So I want to see the Steelers contain the screen game, and I think that'll be important uh, in stopping Isaiah Crowell. Um, Shifting to the Steelers' defense now, who do you think is going to step up for the Steelers in this game against a poor offensive team in the Browns? I have really loved James Harrison this year. The man who doesn't age. He just got promoted to technical starter over Jarvis Jones, as we said. I'm excited to see him on the field more. He's going to be on the field with Shazier now. And he's been a player providing pressure almost all the time when he's in, which almost no one else on defense has been able to do. I, I think he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I I just the, – the Joe Thomas stat made me sad, make me rethink that. But I think maybe he'll get his first sack on Joe Thomas. And uh, what do you think? Who's going to step up for the Steelers on defense for you? Um, Going back to James Harrison really quickly, he only needs one sack to become the Steelers' franchise leader in sacks. So I think – that might be an extra motivating factor. I I could see him getting a sack, but I think for Harrison, it's going to be really nice to have his uh, skill set back in terms of uh, rush defense. I think that's something that's an underrated aspect in his game, particularly now at this point in his career. I think it's what he does best, and I think it's going to be uh, he's going to play a big part in stopping the run uh, tomorrow. Um, my uh, X Factor, or the person I think is going to step up uh, for the Steelers on defense is Stefan it. I don't believe he's going to have any statistics that pop out at you. I don't even think he's going to pick up a sack, but I think looking back at how the Steelers struggled last week against the run, how they got pushed around, how Cameron Hayward is now out, I think he's going to realize that the next man up mentality means that he's going to have to be the guy on that defensive line, and I think he's going to He's going to show us shades of what he showed us last year. I think he's going to be a, just a beast in there, and I'm really hoping he can get it done. So uh, that's that's my X Factor on defense today. All right, let's look at the X Factors on offense. So who do you have for the Steelers on offense? Uh, with an 0-10 team, you're going to have a bad offense and defense most likely, and this is definitely the case with the Browns, but... I believe that given Ben Roethlisberger's home and road splits this year and how he struggled on the road, I think that that in combination with the way the Steelers have struggled to run the ball lately makes it imperative that the Steelers establish the run early against the 31st ranked rushing defense. Bell had some holes early and often in the Cowboys game last week, but as the game wore on, the Steelers offensive line struggled to get a push. I want to see them just wear down this Cleveland team, break their will, and then just use the running game to set up the play-action pass, which we haven't seen that much of this year for Ben Roethlisberger. And only if they do that, I believe the deep ball will return to fruition in the Steelers' offense. I believe they'll be able to have success in the deep ball only if they can get an effective running game going. But it's also important to remember the fact that Ben Roethlisberger does struggle on the road. I That's... Mostly why I want to see the Steelers run the ball, and I think Bell will be the Steelers' MVP or X-Factor on offense this week. What about you, Austin? Uh, I want to go back to on the road. I just want to talk about how at the Cleveland Stadium right now, it is under $30 to get a ticket there. So it is almost like playing at home. It's going to look like there's a lot of Steelers fans there. 
So it might not be as much pressure, <laughs> to be honest, because it's really bad. Once it's on under thirty dollars a ticket, that's worse than preseason. That's how bad they're struggling to sell tickets this year. And I, I expect a lot of Steelers fans. But anyhow, my X factor on offense is going to be Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown's going to have one of the best games of his career in this game right here. And while Ross, Roethlisberger will be a close second, Antonio Brown definitely takes the cake. I'll, I'll explain it more in my uh, bold prediction and score. All right. Um, looking at the Browns' defense, there's really one player uh, that you looked at on the Browns' uh, defense, someone who's been there a while, who's been uh, a Pro Bowl player, but it's someone that's uh, been burned by Antonio Brown a lot over the uh, past few years. But how do you think uh, he can respond? Because uh, he's someone that uh, you think the Steelers are going to have to look out for on defense. Oh, man. Yeah, that man is Joe Hayden. The man is a freak. He's one of the few stars on this winless team. Hayden leads the team in interceptions with three, and he's just so good in coverage. I mean, he struggles against Antonio Brown, which is why I think Antonio Brown's going to have a good game. But he's kept up with some other good receivers, like A.J. Green. He's done it often. It's just I, He just struggles against Antonio Brown. But Honestly, so does I, everyone I, I else, right? Gonna, but, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I sorry was just, one more time? I was just saying, but, I mean, over the past few years, so is everyone else, you know? I mean, he does he does do a good job considering the fact that he plays an elite receiver at least four times, uh, given the fact that he has to play AJ Green and Brown twice a year. Oh yeah, uh, I would also like to mention Jamie Collins. He he deserves an honorable mention because the the ex Patriots linebacker he's been doing great this year. Uh, I haven't really seen much of him on the Browns yet. I know I know he started last game, but. Uh, I, I think he's always a force to look out for. His when he was on the Patriots, he was just so great earlier this season. I'm not sure for your. And, uh, so I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I was just going to ask you who your person to watch on the Browns defense was. Oh, okay. Um, real quickly, going back to Jamie Collins, I'm not sure what his snap counts have looked like, but I'm sure that now that he has a full game under his belt, we're going to see a lot more of him this week, which is. I'm, I'm sure we were sick of him after the Patriots game, but now we get him two more times, so that's fun. Uh, the guy I'm looking out for is Emmanuel Ogba. He is a six foot three, 270-pound athlete at linebacker. He currently leads the Browns with three sacks. While they only have 16 on the year, he's the. it's clear that he's the main pass rushing threat, and this means that he's going to have to be contained. As I already mentioned, Roethlisberger's splits on the road haven't been very good. So the fact that uh, because this is the case, he's going to need as much time and space as possible, and I think that it's important to make sure that he is doubled up when it comes to pass blocking. And if that is done, I believe the Steelers are going to have a much better chance of winning. I don't think that the pass rush is going to affect Roethlisberger much, but he's the one person I'm worried about breaking out. Uh, So looking forward... Do you have any bold predictions uh, for this week? And uh, what do you think uh, the game is going to turn out like? Oh, I'm so excited about this. Uh, the Steelers are going to win 35-10, to 10, breaking their four-game losing streak. Big Ben is going to have four touchdowns and one interception. Bell will have a rushing touchdown. However, the big thing is Antonio Brown. He is going to have a football hat trick. He will have three touchdowns. And the final touchdown will go to Ladarius Green as he records his first in the Steeler. Flipping on to the defense, my bold prediction is that if he plays, Bud Dupree will, will record a sack. That's more wishful thinking, but I'm, I'm just hoping for it, man. What do you think? What, what's going to happen this game? Well, hey, they're, bold predict- they're not called uh, bold predi- predictions for nothing, you know? That, that is a bold prediction, is it not? But anyways, um... Going back to my predictions about the Steelers, I think the Steelers are also going to get back into the win column this week. I think uh, they're going to right the ship, and everything's going to be okay in Steeler land, or sorry, Steeler nation, for at least one more week. I think that the results of last week's game and how heartbroken the team seemed to be last week could be almost a shot in the arm, and I think it's going to potentially be a turning point in the season for the Steelers. I think that we're going to see just how much heart this team has. I think the offense, as I'm hoping, uh, as I said earlier today, I'm hoping they turn to Le'Veon Bell more this week. I, I think he's going to end up with at least 25 carries on the ground for a buck 50 and a touchdown. 
and five more catches for 40 yards. I don't think he'll score through the air, but I still think he's going to be the MVP of the game. I think he can do so much for this offense, and I think against a team that struggles defensively like the Browns, he's going to be someone that the Steelers want to get going to open up the rest of the offense. Defensively, I think that the defense is going to play some more inspiring football. I, I They just aren't very good, but I think against a team like the Browns and it inspired performance is going to help them play a much better game. I think they play the bend but don't break game. I think they'll give up 20 points, but they'll give up a lot of yards in between the 20s. I think they'll have a couple turnovers. I'm hoping, I don't think this is going to happen, but I'm hoping one of the safeties gets an interception tomorrow. And I think the Steelers are going to win this game in a similar fashion to the way they won the opener against Washington this year. I have the Steelers winning 38-20 to this week. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about uh, the game this week before we uh, get going? Which safety do you think is more likely to get the pick, Robert Golden or Mike Mitchell? <laughs> Can I go Sean Davis? <laughs> um, oh, oh, I wasn't even thinking that. Um, honestly, if I have to pick between the two, I'm going to pick Mitchell simply because he plays more and Golden's more of a uh, – more of a he's a strong safety who assists mostly in run support so I'm gonna go uh with Mitchell but if if I guess Sean Davis is more of a safety cornerback hybrid it kind of depends where he's playing but I think this could be the game where he might be able to get an interception simply because of the quarterback play for the Browns um that's that's what I have uh, I have to say about that I gotcha gotcha um just a quick Side note before uh, we end, we probably should have touched on this a couple weeks ago because we were at the halfway point of the season, but I think it's a fascinating question. Who who do you think is the Steelers' MVP this season, at least right now? Because it's, it's a difficult okay. question. I, I was just thinking, I was like, I have two in mind, but you could easily make a case for why the other isn't. So I'm going to start with the one that's questionable. I got Ross Cockrell. <laughs> it's just hard to say after last game where he got the unnecessary roughness call, but the numbers he's allowed receivers like A.J. Green to have, and when he, he shut down Cole Beasley almost the whole game uh, against Cowboys, he's just really doing well. Like, I think A.J. Green only got 38 yards on him. Like, the Broncos did worse. The Broncos cornerbacks did worse against A.J. Green. So that, that's I think that's incredible, but He's questionable because of how the the blown call, uh, the unnecessary roughness last week was bad. But my other one is going to be Le'Veon Bell because while he hasn't gotten going rushing, he's been really crazy in the receiving game. He's been opening it up. He's been checked down to. It's a re- I think he's doing really great. And now that he's got touchdowns under his belt, it really helps him. It really helps that he, now he could possibly uh, possibly be a team MVP. Uh, who do you have? Um, based on the way the defense has played this year, I just, I can't give it to any defensive player. Not even, I'm sorry, but Ross Cockrell, uh, what, based on what happened last week, I can't give it to him for that. Um, I think that's fair. On offense, geez, there, I really don't see anyone either just because of the fact that nobody's been consistent statistically. Bell hasn't played enough yet, in my opinion, to be an MVP. Uh, Antonio Brown has played well, but he's also disappeared at times. His average yards per catch is way down this year. And we already talked about Ben's home and road splits, about how Jekyll and Hyde is in that sense. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Jordan Berry as the Steelers' MVP. Um, <laughs> nice. I mean, if it, might, it is an indication of how inconsistent the team has been, but it also is – I also want this to be showing how, how well he's played this year too – um, this year he has uh, 43 punts on the season. He's averaging 46 yards per punt. Uh, to give you an indication of how other teams have performed, uh, the teams the Steelers have played, they've only been averaging 42.7 yards. Might not seem like a lot, but if you couple that in with the fact that Barry's only had one touchback and he's had 17 punts down inside the 20, it's something that might go unnoticed a lot of times for the Steelers, but... It's something that the Steelers haven't had a good punter in a long time, especially given the way he performed last year. He was just kind of, eh, wasn't, wasn't amazing, but uh, having someone who can flip the field like that 
is something that's really valuable and it's something the Steelers haven't had in a long time. So that, in in combination with the fact that no one else it feels like has played a consistent, uh, has played consistent football, that gives me uh, reason to pick Jordan Berry as a team MVP. He is one of the few players to exceed expectations from preseason and uh, training camp. He is one of the few, and. If you think about it, the the difference in average yards is four yards, and if he punts forty three times, uh, well, I'll round it to forty because it's easy math. That's one hundred sixty yards difference from other uh, punters. That's a really really good statistic, and I think he's having a, a Pro Bowl like season. It, it's a really good stuff from him, and I wasn't thinking about him as my bad. Because he's, he's definitely the team MVP right now. He's doing the best. He's the most consistent. I mean, you shouldn't have to think about special teams players, but, I mean, uh, just given the state of the rest of the team, how, like, how sometimes they play so badly. I mean, if you exclude the Kansas City game, they haven't played, like, a complete game this year. Certainly not on the road, at least. I completely agree with that. I, I, I'm still sad about that game, how the defense can get a shutout. I think that would have been a big confidence boost going into the next week if the defense kept the shutout going. Oh, yeah. Anyways, um, I think that's all uh, we have to go for uh, right now. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap this up? Nope, I'm good. All right. Um, that's uh, it today for the Stronger Than Steel podcast. If you want to uh, check us out or you have any questions about the show or any feedback to offer, check us out on Twitter at capital STSP for uh, the start of podcasts. And then it's lowercase uh, O and then cast for podcast. Uh, one on Twitter, that's our Twitter handle. I did a horrible job of explaining that. So it's STS podcast one on Twitter. So Hopefully you understand that. Uh, check us out on Facebook at Stronger Than Steel Podcast. Uh, email the show, Stronger Than Steel Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we hope to have this episode up on SoundCloud and YouTube as uh, soon as possible. Uh, until then, have a great day and uh, enjoy the game tomorrow. Go Steelers.